Yes or no to this statement. The UN should admit Palestine as a full member state. It is a statement that divides us, but it's one that is worthy of fair and open debate, and that's what this is, another debate from Intelligence Squared US. I'm John Donvan, welcome. Shortly we're gonna move on to round one, but first we wanna ask you to go to the keypads at your seat and take a look again at our motion. The UN should admit Palestine as a full member state. If you agree with this motion at this point, push number one. If you disagree, please push number two. And if you are undecided, push number three. We'll have a second vote. We'll ask you in that second vote to judge which team presented the better arguments. And the team that has moved its numbers the most will be declared our winner. So on to round one, opening statements from each debater in turn. Up for the motion first, the UN should admit Palestine is a full member state, former Israeli government negotiator, senior fellow at the New America Foundation, where he is co-director of the Middle East uh, Task Force, Daniel Levy. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, on October the 10th, 1971, <clears throat> the United Nations admitted the People's Republic of China as a member and kicked out Taiwan. If that were the kind of motion we were debating tonight, I would not be standing here arguing in favor. What we are proposing is to admit Palestine at the UN not instead of Israel, but alongside Israel. Unfinished UN business from the middle of the last century. The assumption of this debate is the two-state paradigm. We do not have anyone here advocating a greater Jewish Israel or a binational democratic state. Nevertheless, it would be hubris to take two states for granted. And we need to recognize certain realities. The territorial viability of a second state in this area looks increasingly precarious. Approximately 600,000 Israelis, one in 10 Israeli Jews live beyond the green line. Settlements grow, outposts are legalized. I invite you to go and see the reality. And it's not just a physical manifestation of blurring. It is also the conceptual universe in which a growing number of Israelis live. Passivity cannot be the response. If we want two states, we have to act. And UN admission for Palestine is precisely the anchor for a two-state future, a clarifying note moment. We need to be deeply respectful of the choices that Israelis are going to have to make, difficult choices, and the conversations in Israel. And therefore, to understand just how unproductive the lack of clarity is for that Israeli conversation. And we encourage the most self-destructive tendencies in Israeli behavior when we pretend that by doing nothing, allowing this slippage away from two states, somehow we're making it easier for Israeli society to change course. We are not. The Palestinians do actually have options. Violence, I'm against that, that's illegitimate. They can use non-violent, coercive diplomacy of sanctioning. I can see its legitimacy, but I'm not an advocate of that. Or they can use declarative diplomacy, draw a line, lay down a marker to get the attention of Israelis. That's what UN membership is. And I would argue it correlates with what is best, therefore, for Israel. We can't expect the Palestinians to wait forever. And we can't say to them that you can neither have self-determination and express it at the UN, but nor can you accept the one state reality and argue for equal rights in one state? Suggesting the Palestinians can do neither is unrealistic, but it's also immoral. UN membership is not a silver bullet. It's not a panacea. It's not sprinkling pixie dust on the harsh realities of the Middle East, but it is an important and legitimate part of a strategy to signal a different future. I urge the other side of this debate to give us more than naysaying to give us more than negotiations. Those negotiations are asymmetrical. One side is so lacking in leverage, and they are so steeped in years of failure. Negotiations cannot be the singular tool in our toolkit. And finally, if we are concerned about Israel's security, then let's acknowledge that hope, too, is a security currency. 
I urge you to support this motion, to support the principle of Palestine alongside Israel at the UN. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel Levy. <clears throat> Our motion is the UN should admit Palestine as a full member state. And here to speak against the motion, Aaron David Miller, here over two decades. He advised six secretaries of state shaping U.S. policy on the Middle East and the Arab-Israeli peace process. He is a public fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center. John, thank you very much, and thank all of you for coming. Daniel, I've known you for many years. I admire your passion and your intellect. You're a powerful advocate of Israeli-Palestinian peace, of logic and common sense. All of this, however, does not address the fundamental problem. It's a conundrum, Daniel. Daniel, we're dealing with a conundrum. We are stuck. Violence will never produce sovereignty for Palestinians, but neither will negotiations right now. So the question is what to do. What you're suggesting, in my judgment, is that we take an action that is not simply neutral, that will retard and undermine the very concept, as dubious as you may believe it is. I speak here not an Israeli to you and not as a Palestinian. I speak with all of its imperfections and contradictions as an American, absorbed in this process for many years. 25 years. And the situation, you're quite correct, Daniel, will be worse. It will get worse before it gets worse. But the question still has to be addressed. How will granting the putative state of Palestine admission as a full member state into the UN address any of this. I know illusions when I see them. I was responsible over the course of a 20 year period for quite a few, as Mustafa will attest, perhaps even Dory. But not tonight. I have no illusions tonight. First, as an American whose country sits on the Security Council, I cannot in all good conscience recommend the admission of a putative state, however morally or ethically compelling it may be, as a full member state. Prime Minister Salam Fayyad, the man who has done more to build institutions of Palestinian statehood on the ground, is against this proposition because he knows it'll undermine the work that he has done. It'll undermine the institutions. Palestine has no borders. It has no control over its population. It has no monopoly over the forces of violence within its own society. In short, it does not control the guns all of the guns in its society. I would argue that's critically important for statehood. Second, as an American, I'd oppose this because I believe it's not symbolic. It's not symbolic at all. It's a prescription and an Rx, if you will, for instability and perhaps even escalation. Think about it. We are admitting the Palestinian Authority that presumes to control Palestine into the UN when, in fact, two other entities. One, the State of Israel, an ally of the United States, and a second factor and force, Hamas, an entity which is an adversary of the United States, has more control over what transpires in Palestine, this putative state, than the Palestinian Authority. That is a prescription for endless contradictions and perhaps even violence. Mustafa will tell you, and he may be right, that the basis for this negotiation and the basis of, for any Palestinian state will be June 467 borders, but admitting Palestine into the UN will mean that a Palestinian president now has the right and the obligation to defend those borders. I wouldn't want to, I mean, maybe you see this as a blessing. I see it as a huge contradiction to put any head of a putative state in a position where he has to defend borders that he cannot defend? And what is he to say to his public when the Israelis continue to do what they will do? Which brings me to my third point. There will be an Israeli reaction. And who is going to control that reaction? The United States? The international community? If you truly had a strategic interest in promoting Palestinian statehood, you, you probably would want to see the re-election of the current president. You would probably want to see the re-election of the current president, which would mean essentially that you're not going to force him into a position to take actions that will weaken the prospects of his own election. Finally, I'll come back to my initial point. Just because we're stuck does not mean the pursuit 
of a strategy that's going to take us farther away than ever from our goal. Admission of Palestine now without an agreement will take Palestinians farther away from sovereignty. Thank you, Aaron David Miller. Time's up. Thank you. A reminder of what's going on. We are halfway through the opening statements in this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate. I'm John Donvan. We have four debaters, two teams of two, fighting it out over this motion. The U.N. should admit Palestine as a full member state. You have heard the first two opening statements and now on to the third to debate in support of this motion that the UN should admit Palestine as a full member state. Palestinian democracy activist, Secretary General of the Palestinian National In Initiative and Nobel Peace Prize nominee, Mustafa Barghouti. Thank you so much and thank you for coming tonight and thank you for inviting me to this debate. I have four reasons that I would like to emphasize why Palestine should be admitted to the UN. The first is that time is not an infinite commodity. If Palestine is not accepted as a state very soon, there will be no two-state solution. And the outcome will be dangerous and bad for everybody. So we need the UN in this case to change the parameters, to change the course the course of failure which Mr. Miller is defending. What they are proposing is to continue what Einstein described as insanity, which is doing the same thing over and over again and expect different results. <laughs> Such a position against UN admission indicates an underlying intention of rejecting the principle of having a Palestinian state which means rejecting the right of the Palestinian people to be free. Continuing negotiations while settlements continue to grow is like having two sides negotiating over a piece of cheese. One side, the Palestinian side, is stuck behind bars. The Israeli side having access to the piece of cheese and eating it while negotiating. <laughs> At the end of the day, we'll find nothing to negotiate about. And that is not a solution. We have one of three options. Either Palestinians would surrender to injustice, and that's what some people are calling for. In this case, what you will witness is the consolidation of a system of apartheid, where Palestinians are discriminated against, and Israel would become the worst apartheid system in the 21st century, something that nobody could be proud about. Or the second option is violence, which we reject, and we don't want. The third option is to have nonviolent peaceful resistance, exactly like Gandhi did in India and like Martin Luther King did here in the United States. And that's the course we are taking. And that's why going to the UN is nothing but another act of diplomatic resistance within the context of popular nonviolent resistance to change parameters and to change the balance of power so that we can have productive negotiations really and have a result at the end of the road. We are now victims of oppression and discriminations. The Israelis are hostage to occupation and fear. We want to liberate ourselves through popular nonviolent resistance, through admission to the United Nations, but we also want to liberate the Israelis as well. Martin Luther King liberated the United States, not only the African Americans from segregation. And Mandela liberated the whole of South Africa, the whites and the blacks together by liberating South Africa from apartheid. And that's why what we want, what we are working for, is to liberate ourselves from oppression, the longest occupation in modern history, and the worst apartheid system and to liberate the Israelis from fear, from the security phobia. One time, a Palestinian leader came to the United Nations with a gun and an olive branch. Today, we are coming to the United Nations with two olive branches. Don't let us drop them. Thank you. Thank you, Mustafa Barghouti. <laughs> Our motion is the UN should admit Palestine as a full member state. Our final debater is going to speak against the motion. He's Dory Gold, world-renowned expert on Middle Eastern affairs. He's former Prime Minister of Israel's foreign policy advisor. 
and the former ambassador to the United Nations, Dory Gold. When I served as Israel's ambassador to the United Nations back in the late 1990s, I had a colleague, a counterpart, who was the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. He became a very close friend and someone I intellectually admired. His name, unfortunately he's passed away, was Richard Holbrook. And one of the things I was struck by, I, before I was sent to the UN, I was an Israeli negotiator. I was sent to the sand dunes of Gaza where Mohammed Dahlan would pick me up in that extended Mercedes and take me to Arafat's house. And we would discuss how to move forward in peace. And by the way, those discussions were tough. Because you, when you're in a meeting like that, you don't know where to park your head. Should you remember the Israelis who died in repeated suicide terrorist attacks that came out of territory under Arafat's jurisdiction? I know that's tough to mention, but you've got to know that. Do you think of those people? Do you think about the moment? Do you think about building a future? Do you forget about the tragedies of the past so you'll have hope? How do you orient yourself? It's very, very tough. But I had that experience, and what I had seen in the 90s is we didn't succeed. Well, let me go back to Holbrook. So I saw that we had a tough time moving forward, and after I left government in 1999, and Prime Minister Ehud Barak came to office, and Barak went to Camp David with Yasser Arafat, and peace wasn't concluded. But I asked myself through my contacts with Holbrook, how was it? that Richard Holbrook delivered the greatest political diplomatic achievement of the Clinton administration, the Dayton Accords over Bosnia, while we didn't succeed in the Middle East. We failed at Camp David. I, I discerned from my discussions with Holbrook and from reading his memoirs on that conflict that there were three elements. He concluded that there must be a negotiated outcome. As much as you can be cynical about tough negotiations, that's the only outcome that will work. The second thing that comes from my experience with talking to him, and it's also in his memoirs, is that peacemaking must come from the parties themselves. The great breakthroughs at Dayton came from those three warring parties. It's true. They were brought to Ohio. It's true. Secretary of State was in and out. President Clinton was ready to come in. But they themselves were responsible for reaching peace, and an imperfect peace. And finally, you need diplomatic flexibility. Now let me move to the issue at hand between us. What is my problem with the proposal that a Palestinian state be recognized as a UN member state? As I said in my opening words, this isn't about national dignity. You know, every people wants to be recognized. And there are a lot of peoples out there beyond the discussion of who's supposed to get independence, Kurds, Tibetans, you name it. Every national movement wants to be recognized at the UN. So my question is about recognizing the rights of Palestinians. Carefully listening to the speech of um, Mahmoud Abbas on September 23rd this year, or last year now, at the uh, UN General Assembly, he wasn't just saying, accept us in principle, he was laying out borders. When we signed the Oslo Agreements, borders were supposed to be negotiated. And that, to that point, to that very point, Yasser Arafat agreed. He signed those agreements. So we're talking about predetermining the final boundaries by moving to the UN. Dory Gold, I'm sorry your time is up. It went by quickly, but you can bring some of that in later on. And that concludes round one of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate. Thank you. So our motion is the U.N. should admit Palestine as a full member state. Keep in mind how you voted at the beginning of the evening because we're going to ask you to vote again at the end of the evening. And the team that has changed the most of your views on this uh, mo on this motion will be declared our winner. So now on to round two, and this is where the debaters address one another directly and answer questions from you in the audience and from me. We have two teams of two. We have Mustafa Barghouti and Daniel Levy 
who have been arguing that the UN should admit Palestine as a full member state uh, for several reasons, including the fact that it introduces hope to the Palestinian people and that hope militates against violence. Also, that in a peace process that is going nowhere, that is stuck, it lays down a marker that the Israelis cannot ignore. The team arguing against the motion, they include Dory Gold and Aaron David Miller, are arguing against this motion on the grounds, number one, that what exists now in the territory controlled by the Palestinian Authority doesn't really meet the qualifications of a state, that it can't control its borders, it can't control its guns. And they're also arguing that it is too soon to give up on negotiation itself. So we're going to take questions from you, but first for me, I want to put a question to the side arguing against the motion. And I think, Dory, this may have been where you were heading. I want to understand why admission of the UN, uh, why admission of Palestine to the UN necessarily precludes the continuation of negotiations. I mentioned that point already, which is, of course, that these are issues that have to be negotiated. You know, for example, one of the hard choices that Mahmoud Abbas has to face, one of the critical issues that he has to deal with is announcing it's the end of the conflict. By going to the UN, getting a Palestinian state, he doesn't have to do that. He doesn't have to come to terms with the question that we keep raising. We're being asked, recognize the rights of the Palestinians to an independent state. So we've done that. But we're asking the Palestinians to recognize the rights of the Jewish people to a nation state of their own. That has to be in the package. But, there, but, 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 but in fact, there, there. But, but how are you recognizing the Palestinian state when you refuse Argentina. to go back to 67 borders? Because the borders have nothing to do with the existence of a state. The, so the borders the state have to be, be up in the air on no borders. No, we have to work out the borders. We have real problems. You know, everyone said, "Oh, just get out of the Gaza Strip unilaterally in 2005." You won't have a full peace agreement because we didn't negotiate, get out unilaterally, and the situation will stabilize. Sorry, no one said that. That was the initiative of the Israeli Prime Minister. Daniel Levy. And he refused to... No one was telling him unilaterally to Gaza. No one was telling us to unilaterally leave Gaza, but everyone said, if you end the occupation, yeah, well, the Gaza, source Gaza of Gaza violence will end. Gaza is 6% of the land mass of the remaining 22% of mandatory Palestine that we're talking about in a two-state solution. No one was saying, end the occupation in 6%, maintain and entrench the occupation in 94%, and see how that goes. Wouldn't you expect, <laughs> Very good. wouldn't you expect that if you get out of a given territory, that the level of violence from that territory would decline? Maybe it would go up elsewhere. Dory, I, let me, no, let me come, I, wait, wait, wait a minute. Raised, Dory, uh, let, let, wait, wait a minute, excuse me, excuse me. Dory, I, right I, I don't feel that you answered my question. Okay. Although, although you said that you had addressed it, my question is, you, you just talked about what's left to be negotiated. Let's take borders for an example. Why not do this political gesture at the UN for the Palestinians? Why would that preclude then having discussions on the borders afterwards? In other words, you, you were saying this stops everything, and I'm trying to understand why this would stop any, everything, and these negotiations could not continue on those points afterwards. Well, what if the very resolution itself states that the borders will be the June 4th lines. Is the Palestinian side willing to rec relinquish that phraseology from a Security Council resolution? Mustafa Barghouti. Well, uh, let me reiterate one thing. Let's remember that in 1947, the right, are you gonna, no, but you'll answer his question? Simple question. Yeah, I'm answering okay. this question. In 1940, he, ha he has been talking a lot, so let me yeah, answer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in 1947, it was decided there will be two states. Israel would be on 54% of the land, Palestine on 44% of the land. Now we are accepting 22%. That's less than half of what we should have had according to the UN in 47. And Mr. Gold wants to take away parts of that land because for the settlements that keep growing, Israel is the only country in the world that has not told anybody yet what are its borders. Why? Uh, but you're not answering because this question. His I think there are four issues for negotiations. There is settlements, there is the borders, there is the issue of refugees, there is the issue of Jerusalem. Nobody said that admitting us to the UN will mean that we will not negotiate about all these issues. Okay, that's the point Nobody I'm trying to come back so. to. And Dory, I'm trying to understand uh, and, why and, you and, say and, that can't happen. Uh, Let me bring in Aaron David it. Miller. We're getting away some, from some very basic issues here. Admission to the UN and recognition would conflate with acknowledgement of sovereignty. 
Legally, that may not be the case, but that is the way it would be read. Mm -hmm. That is the way a Palestinian authority would interpret it. And presumably, that is the way the international community might interpret it as well. And that, the notion that recognition and admission would create the mindset that June 4, 67 borders had been established, had been laid down, would make it more difficult, even though, Mustafa and Daniel, it may well be the only rational, logical outcome is a negotiation with June 4, 67 borders as the basis. Second, you have a divided Palestinian polity, and let's not forget this point, because it's fundamental to the entire argument. You're not dealing here with a negotiation which consists of one gun, one authority, and one negotiating position. The notion that you would admit, as a member state, a divided Palestinian polity, half of which has not even signed up to the conditions that are essentially, by definition, basic to a negotiation. Okay. No, no, John, let's, no, no, one last uh, we'll, point. It's not, this notion of a division between what is morally acceptable, what is symbolic, and what is pragmatic is a, is a division without distinction. No one is doubting the fact that if the Palestinians were admitted into the UN, they would be more hopeful. No one is doubting that it would impress on the international community the notion of Palestine as a sovereign state. What I am doubting, and what you have yet to demonstrate, is that such an act would bring us any closer to okay. meaningful Daniel, I, I, sovereignty. Aaron, I, I want to bring it to Daniel key. because I want to come back to some That's of the points over there. That's what we will show. Please, Daniel, Aaron, 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 given that you've told us that it has to get worse before it gets worse, and that the Palestinians should join the re-elect President Obama campaign, I'm not sure, and this isn't easy because this is probably obvious to everyone in this room, uh, me and Aaron aren't exactly hostile <laughs> when it comes to one another. We're, there's, there's deep mutual appreciation, and I greatly respect the service that Dory Gold has given to the State of Israel. I want to address the, 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 the two points you put out there. First of all, what, what we've tried to make the point of is that if you want a two-state solution, you have to do something about it, and you have to begin to anchor it, and you have to send signals. No one is expecting that the morning after admission of Palestine to the UN, Palestine actually realizes its sovereignty. I would look at this, as I try and look at most things, to be honest, as how do we use this opportunity? How does this become an entry point to problem solving rather than rejecting it as another non-starter? All right, let me come I, back I, to I, 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 I the... want to finish the point. Really I want to finish quickly, the point. Please. My entry point for this as a problem solver is I would turn around and say, Palestine, you're in the UN, you sign the UN Charter, read the words of the UN Charter, Hamas, you want reconciliation, you have to be signing up to the UN Charter as well. I would make this part of the encouragement of internal Palestinian yeah. unity Story and see Gold, the opportunity, not always the threat. Story Gold. Daniel Levy mentions the UN Charter, and you know one of the most important points in this discussion to keep in mind is, sorry to be legal, but Article 4 of the Charter, which says membership in the United Nations is open to all other peace-loving states which accept the obligations contained in the present Charter. Peace-loving states. Why is that important? Uh, Mustafa Barghouti has invoked the names of um, Martin Luther King. I don't know if he said Gandhi, but... Uh, I said Gandhi and Mandela. And Mandela. <laughs> Men who were against violence. If only we had them. Exactly. If only Me the too. Palestinian By political culture had adopted those positions. But really? frankly, frankly, just now on December 22nd in a meeting in Cairo, and I'm not sure whether you were there or not. I was. Yes, okay. I don't want to get it personal, but there was a meeting of the Palestinian leadership that included Khalid Mashal, the head of Hamas, it included the heads of Islamic Jihad. And these are organizations that call for the obliteration of the State of Israel, the destruction of the State of Israel. So how do you square the circle of invoking to an American audience names like Martin Luther King and then going to an event in Cairo with the leaders of Islamic Jihad, which is a wing of the Pazdaran of Iran, of sitting with the Hamas leadership, 
while they, after your meeting with them, are quoted in El Hayat and the Arabic press still calling for armed struggle against the state of Israel. Israel is the third largest military exporter in the world. Exporter? Is, yes. Israel is now, has, you know, hundreds of nuclear heads. We all know that. So when you speak about peace and you speak about nonviolence, you might as well think of how Israel itself should stop using violence. <laughs> now, there's a good point that I would like to hear the answer to, and I think the audience as well. If, in fact, it's very simple. If Hamas is part of the state and the UN is an organization devoted to peace, can you please just bring those, reconcile those two things? It's a, it's a pretty obvious question. There are two m major important developments that have happened thanks to our work, thanks to, to our advocacy of nonviolence, which is that I know there are several statements and you could pick up the bad ones, but the official position now of Hamas is to accept nonviolence. This is a big achievement, and you should be happy about it. If people change positively, you should not get angry, as Mr. Gold does. Also, they are accepting 67 borders. That's an important change. When you speak about the Palestinian Authority being incapable of controlling the security, of course, because it's under occupation. We are the first people in the hum human history who are asked to provide protection to their occupiers without being able to defend themselves from the occupiers. <laughs> that makes no sense. We are saying we are ready to have international troops standing on the borders, even inside the Palestinian government, state. We are ready to be totally demilitarized. We are, but we cannot provide security to anybody and even to ourselves if we are not, in the, if we are not independent. With all due respect think. to IQ2 US, I want to be invited back at some point. <laughs> we're, we're engaged in a kind of a thought experiment here. And there's a certain reality which we, once we leave this theater tonight, will have to take account of. There are only three ways that the Palestinian state will be born. Either the Palestinians will take it from the Israelis by force, which they are unable, and I take you at your word, Mustafa, unwilling to do. Second, an international organization or body or the will of the international community will somehow deliver it to them on their behalf. That is incredibly fanciful. The notion that admission into the UN will give you access to the ICC, the International Criminal Court, the Israelis will have their own case to be made against you. What and you, by the way, what did, what did you think of and, Mustafa's and response to Dory's point that, in fact, Hamas has accepted 1967 borders I mean, and is right That, that in itself is a uh, Aaron, I have tremendous respect for you, Mustafa, but that is a that, that strains the bounds of credulity <laughs> to the to the to the breaking point. Uh, I, I know this is an issue in which people, you know, kind of skate in and out, don't have very deeply held feelings. Um, <laughs> it, I think it's a shame that we've descended into a, a blame game here, and I, I want to try and pick up on a thread that I think Aaron was trying to reintroduce to the conversation. The Palestinians can take this by force, they can have it delivered to them by the international community, and I'm guessing where you're going with the third one is they can convince the Israelis to actually withdraw. Or at least that's where I would go with it. And if you're about to tell me that they can wait for America to deliver it for them, then uh, I suggest you see a production of Waiting for Godot. Dory Gold. Um, no, no, the, <laughs> no, the point, is, the, the point I want to make is <laughs> that I think what the Israeli public needs to see right now, yes, is a continued, pal is more of a Palestinian commitment and a continued by those who are already there commitment to living alongside Israel. But I don't think a charm offensive is the entirety of the ingredients that we have to bring into the mix. We have to bring in the ingredients which says to the Israelis, hey, I hope we're moving away from violence, but we can't sit on the sidelines while you swallow up all of Palestine. So we're going to make declarative attempts. Right, we are in the question and answer section of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate. I'm John Donvan, your moderator. We have four debaters, two teams of two, arguing out this motion, the U.N. should admit Palestine as a full member state. A question? You asked four questions that would um, illuminate the discussion here. Could you please define to me who are the Palestinians? Who 
Whom are we negotiating with? Wait, wait. I'm going to let you elaborate. I, I want to. I, I want to know what you're. I can't elaborate. I am sincerely asking. So you're you're saying the PLO, the PA, the Hamas? Are, are you confused or, or what? Yes, no. I don't. I do not have a sense of a nation of a peoples that are properly represented to have negotiations to make up. All right. I'd like nation. Mustafa Barghouti to take this. There was once uh, an Israeli prime minister by the name of Golda Meir. She said, who are the Palestinians? They don't exist. Well, since then, Israel has been fighting with the non-existing people. And I, I feel I'm so sorry that you think, I'm so sorry that you think this way, ma'am. Because denying the presence of people is nothing but a reflection of racism. <laughs> we are there. We are there. We have our history. We're 11 million people. Six million of us are in the diaspora. You know what? What will surprise you most is how much Palestinians are similar to the Jewish people. Ma'am, I, I mean, the suffering you had, we have, and we will get there one day, where you and us will be happy. The, I together. just want to ask you: Was was the premise of your question the Golda Meir Palestinians don't exist thought? Is that what you were? Yes. No. Just take, take the mic back, because that's why I asked for clarification. Are you saying there's simply a splintered? I'm trying to have a def, uh, some kind of a description of whom are we talking about that we're negotiating with or not negotiating with, what, what is the entity that we can actually work with? What is the actual... Daniel Levy, do you want to take a very quick run at that? Well, Israel signs agreements with the PLO, the, the, the agreements that Prime Minister Netanyahu signed um, that were referred to earlier, those are signed with the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization. There's a negotiation right now uh, as to whether and the conditions under which Hamas and other bodies uh, will join the PLO. Uh, they're not in the PLO at the moment. The PNC is in the PLO. Every member of the Palestinian parliament, which means the gentleman sitting next to me is included, is in the PLO. That's, that, that's who okay. Israel Okay, let's go on to with. another question. Hi, thank you. Um, I want to address this to Daniel Levy. The point that Mr. Miller made about that, how can they control the guns, you're saying that the PLO will be the one to take the seat at the UN Council. How will then they control the guns if there's division within the Palestinian people? You mean how do they control the guns in Gaza? Right. Daniel Levy. Yeah, I, I mean, as, as I've said, there are, I think there are two ways of coming at this. Um, first of all, call me uh, a curmudgeonly pessimist, uh, but I don't think the morning after Palestine's admitted to the UN, Israel is going to say, ah, game's up. We're withdrawing to the 67 lines now. You should be encouraging realistic terms for Palestinian reconciliation, for one authority with one gun. And I think part of the blend of how you do that could be using the very admission of Palestine to the UN, the very signing of that UN charter to hold Hamas to a certain standard on violence. Personally, I think the three, Dory Gold, do you the think three that would quartet happen? conditions I, well, I were not we a good idea. Dory the violence one was. Dory Gold, do you think that. that's what would happen? Unfortunately, Hamas, and this is hard for us to understand this in the West, is a rigidly ideological organization. You know, in 2006, Hamas won the Palestinian elections, not just in Gaza Strip, but also in the West Bank. And Mahmoud Azahar, who would become the Hamas foreign minister, was asked by a Western correspondent, are you willing to change the Hamas charter from 1988? Which, by the way, does not call just for the destruction of Israel, it calls for the murder of Jews. It's a genocidal document, and I have to use that language because that's what it is. And you know what Azahar responded in 2006? Not a single word. Now, many of us thought, you know, British gas has found huge gas deposits offshore in the Mediterranean next to the Gaza Strip. They want to have commerce with the EU, with the world. They'll change. They'll be flexible. They'll meet the quartet conditions. Hamas, from 2006, 
until our conflict with them in 2008, 2009, didn't okay. move. So and they still answer, haven't moved. Your answer is no. To David this Miller. question, to me, is an indication of the fundamental problem. It, it isn't thought through, Daniel. Your, your response to this young woman is simply not rigorously thought through. You're assuming that we can go, go create. On. Help, no, help me with no, my lack I, of rigorous No, that is thinking. not my. I'm out of that business. I'm not here to help you think no, it through no, creatively. But you, but know, you are there. defending a proposition that will, in effect, set into motion a set of consequences over which you will have absolutely no control. This is the fundamental problem. Just because negotiations are stuck, and I, I am the first person to acknowledge just how stuck they really are, doesn't mean that in an effort to maintain hope, to diffuse desperation, and to accommodate some measure of urgency, we need to pursue an idea that I would argue to you, and you've, in my judgment, failed to demonstrate where the real upsides are. The downsides of this are very, very real. This notion okay. is, is reckless, and it's not Daniel, well thought Daniel through. Daniel Levy, to respond briefly Sorry, to that. With all due respect, with all due respect, Aaron, to American omnipotence, I think we can allow Israelis and Palestinians just a little bit of agency. You've said it would undermine negotiations. Negotiations have gone nowhere. You're the one who wrote that it was America acting as Israel's lawyer that undermined that very Camp David effort that you just reminded us about. So come on, give us a constructive proposal to move forward, because we've explained why this helps, and you haven't explained why it doesn't. On the aisle here. Quick yes or no question for Daniel Levy. Is it fair for the Israelis and the international community to expect that in return for what you support, the uh, 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 membership in the UN, that Hamas will say publicly and clearly and consistently forevermore that they disavow violence in an armed struggle against Israel? Yes or no? I do not think that the Palestinian right to self-determination and therefore by extension Palestinian membership at the UN should be contingent on that. What I do think is we should use this vis-a-vis -vis Hamas. And I want to make another point here because we've spoken an awful lot about Hamas. I, I don't know if people have noticed there's something going on in the Middle East. The Muslim Brotherhood, political Islam of which Hamas is a part, is kind of popular when people get the chance to vote democratically. This is a reality we have to deal with. Now, we can bury our heads in the sand and say there's a charter and you have to stand up and publicly disavow X, Y, or Z, or we can work, work day in, day out to try and create a new reality that Hamas relates to, to try and create a new reality that the Muslim Brotherhood relates to, to work with this new reality in the Middle East. And the more Israel buries its head in the sand and says you have to tick boxes X, Y, and Z before we do anything, the worst we are going to make our predicament. All right, Mustafa Barghouti. Yeah. You see, from one side we are told we will not be able to progress because Palestinians are divided. But then the same people, Israel and Mr. Gold, are against Palestinian unity. What we are working on, what we have achieved, actually, through the most recent negotiations, is that Hamas officially declared, on the words of Khaled Mashal, that they are committing to nonviolence. I am trying to explain that to you, and you, you don't want even to hear it. Because, because if change is happening in the positive direction, what you see today is there is no violence. But, okay, Means Mustafa, I'm, I'm interrupting because you made this point. But, yeah. but Dory Gold has, has left hanging out there several very alarming statements made by Hamas. What did you do in Iraq? What did you do in Iraq? What was the Sunni awakening that you worked with? Were these people who were shooting Americans? Did you ask them to make all kinds of pretty statements? Yeah, you no. faced a tough situation. John, John. What are you doing now with the Taliban? Sometimes you have to mix it with unpleasant, unsavory elements. This isn't a, a, a lesson in how to primly have nice tea parties. Daniel? This is the hard Aaron, reality. Aaron David Miller. Look, in a negotiation, at least in this negotiation, even if you were admitted as a member state, the logic of your analysis just isn't good enough. You are gonna, you are gonna need a monopoly over the organized forces of violence in your society, even to induce the Israelis, or even by extension, the Americans, on, on the four core issues that drive the conflict. You will need one gun, one authority, and one negotiating position. Isn't that the case you today? Don't, but Wait. you don't have that, and the presumption is that you should be admitted into the United Nations as a full member state 
Wait, without but it. But he's saying that they do, that you do have it. Is that the, the case West today in the West Bank? Sadly, as a consequence of the Oslo process, the, the area that you do control, you've actually done it as a consequence of intimate security cooperation with the Israelis and assisted by the United States and the Jordanians, quite a lot, yes. So why are you unhappy build, if this and is you're building And you're building the institutions of statehood, but it's a far cry to assume that your national movement right now is unified and cohesive enough to warrant what it is you seek. Right now, and I don't mean to trivialize this, the Palestinian national movement is literally like Noah's Ark. There are two of everything. There are two constitutions. There are two sets of security services. There are two polities. There are two independent At entities. least we have a constitution. And Israel right, does not have a constitution. On this narrow point. <laughs> the the, no, the Noah's Ark is, point. What right? I'm hearing is that a case has been made. What I'm hearing is a lot of obfuscation from the other side. What I'm not hearing is, how do we advance this in a different way? We're making a case for how you can begin to lay down a marker on a rapidly evaporating two-state prospect. And all we've heard, and I thought we'd hear it, and even, I do think there's some onus on the other side to do a little more than give us an hour and a half of naysay. I'd like to address my question to Daniel Levy and Dr. Barghouti. This is a question of context, gentlemen, which I don't think we've heard in this debate. The last legitimate democratic election in the Palestinian areas was won by the Hamas, convincingly, in 2006. The Palestinian, the PLO, Fatah, as the lead faction of the PLO, has failed to conduct negotiations in January 2010 and subsequent. So the only legitimate government in the eyes of the Palestinian people today is the Hamas. On the, on the basis of, of uh, Mr. Haniya in Gaza, he is the legitimate Palestinian leader in the eyes of the Palestinian people. All right, and so how do you argue, so how do you argue that the Israelis should be, that the Israeli public should be comfortable with a legitimate sovereign called the PLO when in the eyes of the Palestinians, the majority of the Palestinians, it is only the Hamas that, it, that was the sidelined and jailed and tortured by the Fatah, legitimate Palestinian leadership. Mustafa Bagarti. Mustafa Barghouti. Let me clarify one point here. When Hamas won elections, they got 44% of the votes and Fatah got 41%. It was the stupidity of Fatah who did not accept full proportional system that led to Hamas getting a majority in the parliament. Today, I assure you, there is a growing number of Palestinians that want to see a third alternative, which I think we represent. And I do not think that either Hamas or Fatah will get an absolute majority in any future elections. What you should encourage is that Palestine becomes a full-fledged democracy with, f with pluralism. I always believed, and I still believe, that the only way to have a peaceful, a lasting peace between both sides is if we have two democracies negotiating an agreement and not to have an agreement imposed from one side on the other. All right, thank you. And that concludes round two of this Intelligence Squared U.S. debate. <laughs> and here's where we are. We are about to hear brief closing statements from each debater in turn. Those closing statements will be two minutes each. And after those statements, we will ask you to vote on this debate and choose a winner. Our motion is the UN should admit Palestine as a full member state. And here to summarize his position against this motion, Aaron David Miller, a former U.S. Mideast peace negotiator, advisor to six secretaries of state, author of a book coming out in September of 2012 called Can America Have Another Great President? Aaron David John, Miller. Thank you very much. I realize that in, in the last 90 minutes that perhaps one of the most astute things that I've done, one of the best decisions I've made was to leave the Arab-Israeli negotiating process. <laughs> Uh, and I say that with tremendous respect and affection for everybody on this panel. If, if the goal is achieving statehood, if that is really the goal, then it seems to me that UN admission simply doesn't make much sense. You alienate the two countries that Palestinians will need, Israel and the United States, to produce meaningful and legitimate Palestinian sovereignty. You will kill Salam Fayyad's nascent state-building effort. There's no question about that. And you're putting your hope in an international community that has never, ever abandoned you, actually, but isn't capable 
of delivering your sovereignty. Please. Thank you, Aaron David Miller. Our motion is the UN should admit Palestine as a full member state. And here to summarize his position in support of this motion, Daniel Levy, former Israeli peace negotiator and senior fellow at the New America Foundation. What I said was right. I think the Palestinians should pursue this in a different way, and it's going to take time, but there's a strategy for getting this. And you know what? Our toolbox is an impoverished one because we have tried so much already. But sticking exclusively with negotiations really must be the dumbest idea. So what do we have left that's nonviolent? Let's use the international tools of diplomacy that are at our disposal to make a statement. We haven't heard negative consequences that can come from this, and mostly we haven't heard what else to do except to blindly continue to place our faith in negotiations, or that the Palestinians somehow should only be ingratiating themselves without creating any leverage with Israel and America. It's been tried. It hasn't worked. The risk is the status quo. The risk is the continued dissent of Israeli democracy to a place where it will be unrecognizable and an inability to reach a two-state solution. We need to send a signal here from this room that a Palestine should be admitted to the UN, and the UN needs to send a signal to Israelis and Palestinians that it's going to be a two-state solution. Otherwise, the next debate will be about equal rights in one indivisible territorial unit. I'm not against equal rights in democracy, but I want an Israel, an Israel that's different, that changes, and I'm sure Mustafa wants a Palestine, and we should have both of those Thank as you. member states of the UN. Daniel Levy, your time is up. Thank you. Our motion is the UN should admit Palestine as a full member state, and here to summarize his position against the motion, Dori Gold, former Israeli ambassador to the UN and former advisor to Prime Minister Netanyahu. These are, uh, this is a very important issue. And I am sorry that at certain points in this discussion we got heated. But the stakes are not just winning a debate in this very nice auditorium in uh, NYU. This is about issues that relate to our very existence. Unfortunately, Mahmoud Abbas has decided on a course of action that he actually began at the end of the Olmert government. It's a course of unilateralism. And with this unilateralism is an effort to get recognized as a Palestinian state with UN membership without having to address our concerns, without having to address the security of Israel, without having to recognize my people's right to a nation state, even though I'm being asked to recognize his people's right to a nation state. And finally, to predetermine the outcome of negotiations by going to the UN and saying the borders will be June 4th, even though the UN back in 67 said we weren't going back to the exact 67 lines. And therefore, I suggest to you, particularly in light of the fact that we're seeing an effort to sell you an unreformed Hamas, an unreformed Islamic Jihad as part of the Palestinian political community, to reject the notion that the Palestinians should be accepted as a member state until they change. Thank you, Dari Gold. Our motion is the UN should admit Palestine as a full member state. And here to summarize his position in support of this motion, Mustafa Barghouti, member of the Palestinian parliament and leader of the Palestinian National Initiative. Thank you. Mr. Gold has repeated practically what uh, Vice Glass, who was the advisor to Mr. Sharon, when he said that we would draw from Gaza so that we can put peace in formaldehyde. We can put peace to sleep. Unfortunately, creating fear is not a solution. And everything that Mr. Miller and Gold have suggested today is nothing but wasting time and losing time. And I am telling them, you can maybe afford to lose time because you haven't lived for 44 years under occupation. You haven't lived for in this position for a long time. And you haven't been humiliated every day by occupying forces. You can maybe even afford to be sarcastic, gloomy, and even depressed. But that will not bring change. Yes, the peace process has become a substitute to peace. And that's why we need to change the situation. When you vote today, don't take away hope 
don't take away light in the end of the tunnel. And let me remind you here with what Plato said. He said, we can easily forgive children for being afraid of dark. The tragedy is when grown people are afraid of light. Thank you, Mustafa Barghouti, very much. And that concludes our closing statements. And now it's time to learn which side this audience feels has argued best. We're going to ask you again to go to the keypads at your seat and to push the keypad whose number corresponds to the side that you feel argued best. If our motion is the UN should admit Palestine as a full member state. If you feel this side, the side in support, argued best, push number one. If you feel the side against this side, argued best, push number two. If you remain or became undecided, push number three. We'll have the, vote, the results of the vote in just a minute. What I'll do is I'll read off the preliminary numbers for, against, and undecided, and then the final numbers for, against, and undecided, and the team with the largest difference will be declared our winner. Okay, I've got them. I've just been given the results. Remember now, we had you vote twice. You've heard this debate, this argument, the arguments for and against this motion. The UN should admit Palestine as a full member state. We asked you to vote before and again afterwards. Before the debate, 37% were in support of the motion that the UN should admit Palestine as a full member state. 30% were against and 33% were undecided. After the debate, 55% support this motion. That is up 18%. 37% are against. That is up only 7%. The undecided went down by 20, 23, 25% to 8%. That means the motion has carried the side arguing the UN should admit Palestine as a full member state has won this debate. Our congratulations to them. Thank you from me, John Donvan, and Intelligence Squared US. We'll see you next time.